First Chronicles chapter number 10, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard after Saul and after his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was wounded of the archers. Then said Saul to his armor-bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and abuse me. But his armor-bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. So Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead... He fell likewise on the sword and died. So Saul died, and his three sons, and all his house died together. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, we're thankful things are different after we get saved. And God, we're glad to be able to come into the house of God. And you are a good God. And we bless you and praise you, Lord, for allowing it to reign in our lives, both good and bad. Because Lord, if we always lived on the mountaintop and only good things happened, we wouldn't appreciate you when things go awry and yet you're a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Lord, if we never had heartaches, Lord, we would never know that you was able to heal our hardships and our heartaches. And God, we just bless you and praise you for being a good God. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd put a hedge about us. I pray that, Lord, the word of God would go forth and it would find its uh, place in lodging places in people's hearts. Lord, grow our faith. Help us, Lord, to ever draw nigh to God that he would draw nigh to us. Lord, you know the need of every heart here tonight and those that are watching via live stream and, and God, those that will listen even later. And God, I pray you'd speak to hearts and I pray that folks would be receptive to the Holy Ghost and to the Word of God. And I pray your will would be manifested and obeyed in each and every heart. Now, Father, get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it, for it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. And amen. I want to draw your attention to several things. First of all, this chapter opens with a conflict. Verse number one, we find that the Philistines fought against Israel. Philistines are always a picture of the flesh. And I've got news for you, friend. You're always going to be in a warfare. The devil hates you. The world, anytime you make a stand, is against you. But even your flesh does not like the spiritual things. And you're always going to be in a conflict. You're always going to be in a battle. Even the great apostle Paul said uh, that when he would do good, evil was present within him. And can I say there are times you have good intentions, you have good desires, uh, you want to be a blessing, you want to help people, uh, and it seems like everything in the world will come against you to keep you from fulfilling those desires to be good to somebody else. Mm, but those desires... Uh, bring evil your way, seem to penetrate and constantly battle you. Can I say, uh, just getting older doesn't mean that you're, you're at a risk from any opposition. You're always going to face opposition. So we see there's a conflict. I want you to notice the cowards. Look what the Bible says in verse number 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines, and said, and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. Look at verse 7. And when the men of Israel that were in the valley saw that they fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, then they forsook their cities and fled. They just left their houses and everything. They fled. And can I say that mm, fleeing leads to forsaking. Verse number 7, it says they fled and they forsook their houses or cities. Forsaking always leads to a fall. Verse number 1 said they fled and then they fell slain. Can I say that there are folks who will flee things they've been taught to know and be as right, and then they'll forsake those things of God, it won't be long, they'll fall. There have been people I've known that have served God, and then all of a sudden quit serving God. 
then they forsake the things of God and you hear of them being involved in things you'd have never dreamed that they'd ever be a part of. And before long, they fall into sin and they don't even resemble somebody that used to live for Christ. But notice these folks are cowards. Three times it mentions that folks fled. I'm reminded over there in 1 Samuel 17, there was a big ugly Philistine giant named Goliath. And the whole army of Israel cowered on the mountaintop and would not go down and fight this man. And here comes a, a little ruddy looking fellow that was the tender of his father's sheep. He come to bring supplies to his brothers to the battle and he hears this big giant cussing the, uh, uh, God and cussing the armies of God. And he says, uh, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? He says, is there not a cause? And uh, David said, I'll fight him. They went and took and put the king's armor on him. And uh, Saul was head and shoulders taller than any man in Israel. And uh, it would be like me putting my sport coat on Joseph. It would look ridiculous. And David said, I can't fight with these things. I haven't proved them. So he went and got five smooth stones. He took a sling. Went out there and he ran to the battle. He told that giant, he said, you come to me with sword and spirit. I come to you in the name of the Lord. Uh, and you know the rest of the story. Uh, David uh, slung that stone. It hit gi the giant in the only place he didn't have armor, right between the eyes. Uh, uh, and he fell forward. And listen, uh, you never punch anybody and he falls forward. He always falls backwards. Uh, but he fell forward. Why? Because God smote him in the back of the head. Uh, hey, David took Goliath's own sword and chopped his head off. Uh, became a known uh, as the champion of Israel. You say, why do you say that? Uh, where are the dead? in this chapter uh, who will stand up to the Philistines uh, who will take care of business uh, who will do something for God uh, David got five stones because Goliath had four brothers he was taking care of all of them hmm? where are those kind of people where are those kind of people today that will make us stand I know Baptist preachers That'll say, well, if the governor says we can't have church and we can't have church, we've got to obey the governor. Well, what did Peter say? It's better to obey God than man. Mm. And God said not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together. Live stream is not assembling together. Mm. Say, preacher, you shouldn't be that way. This is 2021, and that's why the Lord's coming back, because there's not enough people that will make a stand. People are dying and going to hell all around us while Christians are cowered in the corner. Well, I'm afraid I might get sick. I got news for you. There's always a virus. Mm, that whole thing last year wasn't about a virus. It was about the election. Mark her down. I got two people agree with me. What a blessing. They were cowards. I know a lot of Christians that are cowards. They're afraid to tell anybody about Jesus. Afraid to let anybody know they're a Christian. Afraid to come to church. Afraid that uh, uh, somebody might cough on me. But they'll go to Walmart. They'll go to work. Well, get off of that. Some of you might get upset. I'm really tore up about it. Mm -mm. Now, used to, Christians had backbones like a saw log. You read Hebrews chapter 11. Hmm? Used to, preachers had backbones. Now preachers are so afraid they'll lose their job, they want to appease people. i got news for you, I don't have a job, I have a calling. God's taken care of me for 47 years, are you listening? Hmm? They were cowards. We see the conflict, we see the cowards. I've got to move on, I'll never get to the message. Notice the calamity in verse number 6. So Saul died, the king of Israel and his three sons, and all his house died together. What a calamity. The one who, when he was little in his own eyes, was greatly used of God. Now him and his three sons are dead. Notice the cruelty. Here's the part that, you know, man didn't pin down. Look at verse 8. It came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And when they had stripped him, they took his head 
and his armor and sent it into the land of the Philistines round about to carry tidings unto their idols and to the people. And he put his armor in the house of their gods and fastened his head in the temple Dagon. It's pretty gruesome. That's why Saul fell on his own sword. That's another thing man wouldn't write. Saul took his own life because he knew that's what they would do to him. It's a far cry from somebody who would depend on God to deliver him. We see the cruelty. And they paraded the armor of Saul all around the land of the Philistines. They put his head in the temple to Dagon their God and Dagon by the way is the one that God knocked over and knocked his hands off then knocked his head off that's when the Philistines begged for the Israel to come get the ark back notice if you will the cause why did Saul die why did his sons die look at verse 13 so Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. As a matter of fact, witchcraft. Hmm? Yeah. And inquire not of the Lord. And therefore he slew him, the Lord, and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. Saul, his sons died because Saul sinned. Hmm. God told through the man of God to the king to go in and slay all their enemies. Man, woman, child, and beast. The man of God comes to the camp of Israel. And Saul runs out and said, I did everything you told me to do. Well, first of all, he spared the life of the king. And then he kept the best of the livestock. And the man of God said, well, what is the lowing of oxen and bleeding of sheep that I hear? So the man of God had to slay the king and the livestock. And God took his hand off Saul from being king. Then Saul got jealous of David and tried to kill David. And this whole campaign is about Saul looking for David because he knew David was anointed next king. And God wouldn't speak to Saul anymore, so he hired a witch. Are you listening? It's amazing how far people will go when God takes his hand off of them. Saul's boys didn't have to die it was Saul's fault mom and dad you better be careful your sin will be carried out to the third and fourth generation Mm -hmm. it does matter how you live for your children Mm -hmm. I know all that's pretty heavy let's turn the tide can we do that now look at the crowd that's cut from a different cloth Look at verse 11. And when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, they arose, all the valiant men, and took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days. There's a whole different crowd. Now can I say this crowd right here was not Israelites. But they had come under the umbrella of the protection of Israel, and they served Israel. And when this crowd heard what they'd done to Saul and his sons, they didn't flee. They rose up. The valiant men said, no, we're not going to stand for this. And they went and got the bodies and gave them a proper burial. And then they fasted for seven days. And I say that they stood regardless of the cost. They knew what they... Brother James, in order to get the bodies, they had to go where the Philistines were. They didn't go in the middle of the night when nobody was there. Said valiant men rose up. They stood regardless of the cost. They said, not on our watch. Can I say? They made a statement to a nation in disarray. They're telling Israel, you may not care about him, But hey, he served us well. We're going to go take care of business here. Hmm? There are some things to respect whether you agree with it or not. Saul died, my dear friends, out of the will of God. 
but they still respected the office of the king of Israel. Hmm? There are some things still worth respecting. I wouldn't give you two nickels for Joe Biden, but I still respect the presidency of the United States. Can I say there are a lot of things going on in America that I disagree with, but I still uh, support the red, white, and blue. I'm still proud to be an American. I'm still thankful uh, that I live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Uh, and even though uh, she's not all that she could be, and she's not all that she has been, she's still better than the alternatives, friend. Mm. And can I say they showed respect to the things of God? This crowd, crowd cut from a different cloth. Now I want to preach with God's help just a few minutes on running with the right crowd. I don't want to flee with a bunch of losers. Hmm? You would not believe the excuses I get from people why they're not in church. I don't want to run with that crowd. Hmm? Matter of fact, I had major surgery. I didn't have no minor surgery. I had major surgery. I had two surgeries Friday a week ago. Hmm? Are you listening? I haven't missed a church service. Now, is that because I'm big and tough? No, I'm old and feeble. But I serve a great God who's worthy to be worshipped. Uh, now, I know some of you didn't like me walking on, you know, in the Moses' stick that I borrowed from Miss Kathy, and you didn't like seeing me in the collar that I had on, and, and, and all those things, you just feeling sorry for Brother Doug, and all that. I understand all that, but I was here. I've seen people get a toenail extracted, and they'll miss three weeks. Hmm? I don't want to run with that crowd. Hey, my God's big enough to take care of me. Hmm? If I can get out of bed, you know I'm going to be at church. There wasn't anybody that really doubted that I wouldn't walk in that Sunday morning two days after surgery. Did you really? Anybody really doubt that? I even gave the announcements. Remember that? Did you really? Some of you probably thought I'd even preach. Uh, there wasn't none of that that day. I couldn't walk. Huh? But listen. It's funny. Miss Sonny asked <laughs> Brother Bob, who's going to preach Sunday? He said, well, Brother Doug will. Ah. How long you know me, Miss Sonny? Not long enough, obviously, huh? I told some of them, I got preacher friends, they're all, Brother Doug, you got to take it easy. You got to take care of your body. You got to take it easy. You take... I said, I just threw out a little seed. I didn't do much. But listen, I don't want to run with that coward crowd. I don't want to run with that crowd that's it's, it's all tore up, worried about everything going on in the world and everything. I want to run with a crowd that's right. Hmm? So running with the right crowd. Can I say, if you're going to run with the right, right crowd, first of all, it takes fortitude. You can't be a sissy and run with the right crowd. You can't be a pansy. You can't be a panty waist. You can't be a mama's boy. You can't be a thumb sucker. Huh? You can't be a, 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 somebody can't make a decision. You're always wringing your hands, worried about everything. Well, I got the vaccine. I've had COVID. I've got three masks, and I'm just still worried to go out and go to the public. You ain't going to run with the right crowd. It takes fortitude. Can I say it takes a little discipline? Uh, I've said just about every service, make sure you wash your hands, make sure you, you take vitamins, keep yourself clean. And by the way, let me go over here to Mr. Retired Nurse. You're not going to believe this. Well, no, I ain't going to talk to you. Let me go talk to the guy with the pacemaker in his chest. It's going to fire right here. Eighteen months, we've not had any flu because COVID's cured the flu. You're never going to believe what they got a shipment of you today. Flu test. Oh, so I guess flu's coming back, huh? Huh? So you don't have to worry about COVID anymore, Miss Pam. That's going to be flu. All right. You know how you you combat the flu? Vitamin C, wash your hands, you know, don't be around, you know, when you got a fever and coughing and don't get to go, hey, uh, it don't matter what it is, if you got anything going around, you got to be disciplined with that thing. You don't understand, uh, if I hang out with somebody that's coughing and sneezing on me, I'm going to get sick, huh? Just use a little common sense. Our rule around here has always been, if you got it, keep it to yourself. You got a fever, stay home. But it takes discipline if you're going to run with the right crowd. Not only when it comes to 
those things are going to take discipline in Christian things. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to pray. You've got to seek the Lord. You've got to trust the Lord. Uh, you've got to uh, make up your mind that uh, uh, regardless of the waves of opposition, uh, regardless of the problems, regardless of the obstacles, uh, 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 set your eyes on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, make up your mind. You're heaven bound with the hammer down. Uh, and you're going to serve God, come what may. Uh, that takes discipline. Mm. Some of you have been here a long time. This wasn't the first surgery I've been to, through, and it wasn't the first time right after surgery I was in church. Why is that? It's because God's been good to me, and I've just disciplined myself. Church is where I'm going to be. Mm. Can I say this? It takes discipline. It takes determination. I want to help you something. It wasn't easy getting out of bed that Sunday morning when I came to church. They took two bones out of my hip. Got on my doctor today. I told him, there's the box where you said you're going to be sore. There's a box where you said you're going to have pain. You didn't tell me about that box that says you're going to regret the day you was ever born. That's where I was, huh? He did what you did. He laughed. I was serious. It wasn't easy getting out of bed. But I was here. You know why? I was determined to be here. The Bible says, so as a man thinketh, so is he. If you think you can't, guess what? You won't. But if you determine in your mind you will, guess what? You will. It takes determination. The difference between champions and those that aren't champions is champions just make up their mind they're going to do what it takes to become a champion. They determine they're going to put in the extra work. They're going to determine to do that little extra thing. Uh, uh, listen, if you want to uh, uh, bring sports into it, uh, uh, doesn't matter what sport, pick out the sport. From uh, uh, Across the board, the athletes today are superior. They're all excellent. Pick a team. Every athlete on, the, on their team is, is excellent, superior. The ones that become champions are those ones that do those little extra things. The things that never show up in the box scores, the things that never are seen, the things that aren't in the limelight, uh, 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 guys that show up and, and, and shoot an extra 100 shots, 100, extra 100 free throws, uh, 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 football players that stay late and run extra routes, uh, uh, get some extra work in, uh, those that spend a little extra time in the weight room, those that spend a little extra time watching film of their uh, uh, opponents, all the little extra things is what gives them enough to get across the championship line. And can I say, to be a champion Christian, you're going to have to be determined. I'm going to just do a little extra. Yeah, I was going to read three chapters a day. I'm going to make up my mind and reading four. Oh, I was going to pray uh, uh, morning, noon, and night. I think I'll throw in the next one in there today. Just determined to do a little bit more. You'll never go wrong doing more for Jesus. And then it takes dedication. You've got to do it every day. It takes fortitude. Now, I understand that there are some people who are weak-minded. I understand that. Brother Mike Jackson's one. Why do you think he married Lisa? He took what he could get. I mean, you know. I was only serious, okay. Uh, oh, I hadn't picked on her in at least two weeks. There are some people who are weak-minded. Well, if you're going to become disciplined and dedicated, you've got to understand your strengths and your weaknesses. And if you understand that you have a problem in a certain area, then what you do is you fortify yourself uh, and get everything that you can in your life that helps you in that weakness. And then you'll overcome it. But if all you want to do is say, well, I just can't, and you won't. There are some people that are weak-minded. But you need to draw from the strengths that you have and overcome that weakness. Hmm? What's the little engine that could? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, and he did. You've got to retrain your thought process. And how does that happen? By being in the Scriptures. By being around the right crowd who you can draw from their strength as well. You know why I ask for testimonies? Because somebody will stand up and say something. It might click with somebody else on the other side of the uh, uh, sanctuary and say, Boy, if, if God brought them through that, God will bring me through that. It takes fortitude. If you're going to run with the right crowd, can I say this? It's going to take faith. Yeah, the, the biggest argument against 
folks that want to close churches and all that, where's your faith? Hmm? You got to have faith in the Creator. I just believe God's bigger than anything that we'll ever face. I just believe that. I don't just say that, I believe that. He's proven himself in my life time and time and time and time again. I just believe that. I just believe you can't outgive him. I just believe you can't outwork him. I just believe you can't outdo him. He's just God. And I believe that with every fiber of my body. You've got to come to where you have that kind of faith. You know what Jesus said? One of the last things he said his disciples when the son of man cometh will he find faith on the earth you would think of all the churches that claim to be Christian and claim to be getting ready to go to heaven when the Lord comes back you'd think of all the people that named the name of Christ there'd be so much faith in this world the devil wouldn't even, wouldn't even stand a chance but there are so many people that are so afraid of so many things they just don't have faith See, we've learned to survive without God. You need money, you go to the bank. Or throw it on a credit card. Hmm? You need a job, go to a staffing agency. Hmm. We even got it, if you need food, just stand out in front of Myers with a sign. We'll work for food. People bring you Chick-fil-A for free. Hmm. We've got to figure out how to survive without God. I remember a time when if you didn't have groceries, you had to pray them in. That's what's wrong with this generation today. They've never seen mom and daddy have to pray it in. I remember watching my grandma and grandpa praying, and the next morning somebody knocking on the door, and they bringing in groceries. I remember those days. I remember when folks were sick, you didn't run, run them to urgent care. There wasn't no such thing. You got a hold of the great physician. And what was a grave fever in the night broke. And in the morning, they were fine. I've seen it. I've seen people grab a hold of the horns of the altar and the whole situation change. But we don't have faith in God like that today. Hmm. Got to have faith in the Creator. Got to have faith in His commandments and His Word. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by His Word. We're so anemic in our faith because we don't read the Word of God. We don't hide the Word of God in our hearts that we might not sin against the Lord. We don't have a steady appetite of the Word of God. It amazes me. We can tell you every, everything that's on the TV guide. I tell you every night the channels are on. We can tell you every stat of every uh, uh, of our, our favorite ball teams. We can tell you uh, uh, what's going on in Washington. We can tell you everything that's been posted on Facebook. We can tell you everything about everything except the Bible. Yet, can I tell you, you're going to be judged by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. I'm talking about running with the right crowd. You're going to have to have faith. You're going to have faith in God. You're going to have faith in His Word, the Creator, His commandments. But you're also going to have to have faith in a cause. These children around here are worth making a stand for. Hmm? Now, I, I can only imagine what the children were thinking when Israel was fleeing and forsaking their cities and saying, but that's our house, and they're running. So, but the Philistines are coming, the Philistines are coming. Yet that crowd from Jabesh Gilead, they rose up and their children watched them walk off, come back and have a burial service for Saul and his sons and fast for three days and three nights. I imagine them kids are saying, that's my dad right there. Mm-hmm. And them children grew up, they said, I remember when my parents stood for something, didn't run. Mm-hmm. What about these children? Time to time, the kids will make stuff for me do stuff for me I keep that close because when the enemy steps up on my shoulder and says well, you're not doing any good around here I just pull out one of them little notes from one of them little kids you know what I do I wave that in the face of the sorry devil you got to have faith in a cause see this cause is bigger than us it's bigger than the Emmanuel Baptist Church 
All around here there are families. We heard of one uh, in a neighborhood not far from here where the marriage is in turmoil and trouble. What about those children? Uh, who's going to make a difference? Uh, who's going to shine the light? Uh, uh, there are families like that all around here. They need some hope. They need some help. Uh, this cause is greater than us. You're going to run with the right crowd. It's going to take fortitude. It's going to take faith. But it's also going to take fight. Mm. I'm the kind of person you don't want to tell me I can't because I'm going to show you that I will. My daughter got a little bit of that. Mm. You've got to have some fight. I don't want to be a coward. Mm. i got just enough redneck in me. You don't want to just, you just got to be careful what you say to me. You've got to have some fight. When it comes to the things of God, we've got to have some fight. You say, well, show me that in the Bible. Well, don't you remember when Jesus walked in and them money changers were in the house of God? He made a three-quartered whip and he drove them out. Sounded like he had a little fight. Sounded like he had a little respect for the house of God. Sounded like there was something that really meant something to him. He's about ready to go to the cross and pay for it. Are you listening? Uh, and he wasn't going to let a bunch of uh, uh, sorry, no good reprobates uh, defame the house of God. We've got to have some fight. We've got to have a little grit. Little gumption. Mm. Mm, Got to have a little gusto about us. Mm. Whatever happened to our fight? We ought to be willing to contend with hell that we might see folks saved. Mm. Be willing to contend with the powers of be that another one to get in the faith. Talk about running with the right crowd. You've got to have some fight about you. Hmm. Can I say this? You've got to have some fuel. You're going to run with the right crowd. You can't run without fuel. You've got to have some fuel. Hmm. You've got to be fueled by what's appropriate. You know why they went and got the bodies of Saul and his sons? Because it was what was right to do. We've got to be fueled by what's moral and what's right, what's ethical. Stand against things that are wicked. We've got to be fueled by what's appropriate. We've got to be fueled by atrocities. All last weekend, special after special on 9-11, and yet there's people in this building wasn't alive. I was on my way to a preacher's meeting. Miss Nett called and said there was a plane. She was off that day. She said there was a plane hit one of the Twin Towers in New York City. My first thought was that tra air traffic controller was getting fired. A few minutes later, she called. She said a second one. I'm thinking, uh-oh. That ought to still cause something to well up in this, inside of us. And some of the same people responsible for that, we just gave them $87 million worth of uh, equipment and gave them everything that we stood and supposedly fought against for the last 20 years. That shouldn't sit well. That was an atrocity. Thousands of people died just going to work that day. Many died as a result of it for the next 20 years by getting all that ash and stuff in their lungs going in trying to save people. It was an atrocity. Every now and then we need to be reminded what Hitler did to the Jews. Loaded them up in boxcars, took them off to concentration camps, put a lot of them in gas chambers. That was an atrocity. You've never been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. You ought to go. So you can see what evil does. And it ought to wake something up in you because a lot of the same tactic, tactics the Nazis used in that day, and it's happening in Washington today. Won't be long, they'll be giving you an eye number. You all think I'm crazy. I know. I've been telling you for five years. They built a concentration camp less than two hours from here. 
Five years ago, the government started buying up all the 9 millimeter ammunition they could get. Why did the government need all that ammunition? Why in the world did they build an, a readiness center right over here off of Burlington Pike? Why did they have a National Guard readiness center right there? My brother-in-law watched them build it. He said there's more underground than what's above ground. Why is that there? Why is there a concentration camp right off of I-74? Who are they wanting to corral? Could be that unvaccinated crowd. Because you don't care about people's safety. Now let me just use a little common sense here. If the vaccine is so great and the mask is so great, why are you worried whether or not I've got it? If you're taken care of, why are you worried about me? Huh? And let me just say this, by the way, this just came out. You're not going to find this anywhere else. Harvard did a study. 70% of the people getting COVID right now have been vaccinated. So what did you get in your body? Whatever it was. Didn't keep you from getting COVID again. Well, it's a new strain. Can I help you something? There are no separate tests to see if you got the original one or the Delta variant. There are no tests. So if they tell you you got Delta, liar, liar, pants on fire. Just trying to help you. You can drink the Kool-Aid if you want to. But see, there's coming a day if you're not vaxxed. They're already saying it. You won't be able to buy, buy groceries in a grocery store. You won't be able to go to restaurants. You won't be able to get on an airplane. For long, you're not going to be able to leave your area that you've been assigned to. Kind of sounds like the mark of the beast. If you don't have the mark of the beast during the great tribulation period, you won't be able to buy and sell. Huh? They'll tell you where to go. Are you listening? They're going to hunt you down and kill you. Friend, the Lord's coming back. You better be ready. He's a coming. I'm telling you, everything's in order for the devil and his crowd. I want to be running with the right crowd. I need to be fueled by what's appropriate and by atrocities. I also need, also need to be fueled by anger. You say, well, we're not supposed to be angry. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says be angry and sin not. Can I help you something? God's angry with the wicked every day. Right. There ought to be something that just angers you and causes you to get out of your little comfort zone. There's nothing spiritual about what I'm going to say, but I'm about to say it. Channel surfing last night. I watched that movie Dodgeball. Anybody seen that movie? It's a stupid, wicked movie, but I watched it anyway. They got this old guy that's on the dodgeball team. He wears goggles, wears short shorts, high socks. He's the epitome of a nerd. My favorite part, though, is when, they, when the guy tells him, if you can dodge traffic, you can dodge a dodgeball. And they got him out there running in five lanes of traffic and cars are hitting him. It's, it's funny. I just laugh at it. I'm thinking, if you're stupid enough, let a car hit you. Anyway, they're playing in this one match. Hey, they're down to him. There's no hope. He throws worse than a girl. He has no redeeming qualities of an athlete. It's up to him. And the coach tells him, you've got to get angry. And he looks up, and his little mail-order bride's flirting with a guy in the stands, and he gets angry, and all of a sudden he turns into Arnold Schwarzenegger. He catches all the balls. He throws and knocks everybody out, and they win the match. Well, that's what needs to happen to us. We need to get angry. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Get angry, guess what? You'll pray. You'll read your Bible, you'll stand. You'll make your voice be counted. You'll pass out tracts. You'll invite folks to church. You'll, you'll get out of being just a non-existent Christian. Need that fuel. thought about this lastly. If you're going to run with the right crowd, you need the fear of the Lord. You need to have a fear of disappointing the Lord. So many people are afraid of disappointing so many others. What about the Lord? I don't want to disappoint Him. You ought to have a fear of degrading Him. I don't want to bring shame on the Lord. If I'm sitting over in a corner worried about the virus and not doing what God called me to do, do you think I'm really bringing honor to the Lord? No, everybody's looking at me saying, what's wrong with that little sissy-pied Christian over there? I don't want to degrade the Lord. Can I help you something? 
Study history. There was the Black Plague. There was the Bubonic Plague. There was smallpox. We can go on and on and on of things that did wipe out cities. But God was still God, and folks still served Him. We wouldn't have a church today had they not. But I wonder if the Lord wasn't to come back for another hundred years, what kind of churches would be left in America? I don't want to disappoint the Lord. I don't want to degrade the Lord. But we also ought to have a fear of the day that we'll face the Lord. We're going to the judgment seat of Christ, giving account of the deeds done in our body after we got saved. You're going to look into those eyes as flames of fire. I wonder how many people say, but Lord, I was so afraid of the vaccine. So I just stayed out of church. Lord, I was so afraid of what people thought of me and I wouldn't give them a track. No, people aren't going to say anything. The books will be open and they'll be indicted. I do not want to disappoint him. I don't want to degrade him. But I'm sober to the fact that one day I'll face him. I want to run with the right crowd. I want to have the fear of the Lord. What will the fear of the Lord do? What are the results of that? What are the results of running with the right crowd? Look over Psalms 112. We'll be done. Psalms 112. This is just a small glimpse of the right crowd and fearing the Lord. Psalms 112. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. It's kind of what I've been preaching, hasn't it? His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil, evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. I want to run with the right crowd. How about you tonight? You want to run with the right crowd? There is a difference, and there will be a difference in eternity. I wonder, what crowd are you running with tonight? I want to run with the right crowd. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While he comes to pick out something, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we bless you. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, even though there were some who fled and forsook, we're glad for that valiant crowd that stood up, made a difference. Lord, I'm sure that Saul's extended family was grateful for it. Lord, I'm sure you're still blessing the generation of that people today. Lord, we're still reading about them. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have the fear of the Lord. Help us to have some fight, have faith and fortitude. Lord, to make a difference in these days. What, a, what better day to serve the Lord than right before His coming. Lord, we ought to be shining the glorious light of the gospel like never before. God, help us to be found faithful to Your faithful name. Now, Lord, bless this invitation. Speak to hearts. Some are already coming into the altar. I pray You'd bless them and help them. God, I pray that, Lord, you just touch people's lives, help them want to run with the right crowd. Now, Father, we do pray, crowd this size, there may be somebody here unsaved, strangers to the grace of God. I pray that, Lord, you'd convict them of sin. Help them, Lord, want to be saved and run with God's crowd. I pray they'd come give their life to Jesus. Lord, have your will and way now. Bless and we'll thank you for it, for it's in the lovely name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.